The American idea is this most beautiful idea. We're the only country founded on an idea. The condition of your birth does not determine the outcome of your life. You work hard, you play by the rules, you can get ahead. You make a mistake in life, you can redeem yourself and build your life. That's what Jack Kemp talked about. Here's the problem. If it is not true for everybody, then it's really not true at all, is it? So our job is to figure out how to rebuild the American idea. The comeback movement is a movement of people around the country in challenging circumstances. Sometimes the circumstances are geographical. Sometimes the circumstances are personal. Where people have decided to rise above those circumstances to ensure that they can come back into the mainstream of society, a stream towards their dreams, social order where they are not victims, but they are rather contributors to society, where they are not dependent, but rather independent. America is in desperate need of transformation, particularly among those that are most economically and socially isolated and disadvantaged. The Comeback Series makes every American a witness to redemption and transformation. Human life makes us have to constantly come back from things. But this particular movement is about coming back from the places where most folk have been left to die. The government has created a commodity out of poor people, where 70 cents of every dollar goes not to the poor, but it goes to those that serve poor people. They ask not which problems are solvable, but which ones are fundable. So you have people going in to these areas and saying, let me fund this stagnation to ease my conscience, but not to change the reality. When you have politicians and social service providers and think tanks who deal at a high level on the theory of change, but not on the ground level of who you have to ask to get that change, you miss some critical information. There's this misnomer that somehow education endows intelligence. <laughs> Doesn't. But that's difficult for people to, to get their arms around in our social economy. By contrast, the real experts on poverty are the ones who have demonstrated that they have provided a pathway for low-income poor people out of poverty. They are the social activists, the community antibodies that are indigenous to the community. We deal with people at a close range, and so it's hard to fool somebody when you're dealing with somebody in that level of truth and that level of proximity. You have an environment that is volatile, that is suffocating with violence. And so you have a person who will see the police as an enemy. You have a police that will see a person as a violator rather than a victim. See, you, don't, you have these misnomers and misinterpretations that go back and forth in critical areas in our community. So you have what you have now, a wholesale poverty industry that does not change the bottom line, the people that they serve. One of the reasons why we have a difficult time addressing poverty, we haven't really clearly understood the nature of the problem. Not everyone is poor for the same reason. The Center for Neighborhood Enterprise and its vast network of grassroots leaders in these low-income, high-crime areas, they don't confront them with programs. What they do is they confront them with a witness. And so what I did was bring some of the more thoughtful ones together in Washington where they became the primary providers of insight and information about reducing poverty, where the academic scholars were respondents to them. We go out on the streets and we meet people right where they're at and um, because we are them. I mean, I think that's the misconception that that people have about other people is that, you know what, we're all, we all struggle with something. We care about them beyond nine to five. They can call us at any time and we're gonna be there for them. We're in the business of helping people that other people don't wanna help. And so we have to forgive, forget, 
release and relinquish. People's present situation don't dictate their final destination. They can go to a real, they can go to a real transformation when they meet us. Every caterpillar can be a butterfly. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Every caterpillar. Absolutely. Absolutely. You work with a lot of adults who are transitioning either out of prison or out of challenging situations. What can we do on our side of the fence to better reach out or support you as you're helping uh, adults? And particularly for you, you're working with young people, ex-gang members. What are some recommendations for us to try to help you know, that, that uh, target population? Well, I think um, the, the first thing is to, I think institutional challenge is necessary in this sense. Some of the, some of the previous ideas that don't work, mm -hmm. which have been you know, funded fully and, and research well, uh, we should have that same litmus test applied to us. Mm -hmm. See, so we need people like the American Enterprise Institute and others to come behind us and follow Bob, follow us, and say, what is what is the process? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, like we're doing here, we're describing what we do, mm -hmm. but I think there is a, a, a thought that it won't intellectually hold up. <coughs> and it can, okay. see, but we need intellectuals to hold up our testimony and say, it makes sense, not just it makes change. Omar does not talk about success in terms of uh, producing clients. He talks about success in terms of producing citizens. This business here is political, I'm sorry. Inescapably, necessarily. That doesn't mean it has to be partisan and that doesn't mean it has to not get anywhere. Politics of American cities are based on failure at this point. Until you can't win by failing by, by way of federal funds. Uh, the kind of replication of, of moral of, of moral example that we're talking about can't take place on a very large scale. A part of the question we have to ask is how do we nourish that space so the people who want to solve these problems and who exist at the level of the problem, who are meeting it face to face, hand in hand, can have a chance, can have a shot. There is a kind of poverty industry, I think all that's true. There are also a lot of very well-meaning people who are going about trying to solve these problems in a misguided way and, and trying to figure out how to take what you're doing and manage it at a national level when what we should be figuring out is how to create the space for people to arise out of these communities, all kinds of communities that need help, and help one another. Uh, I'm not saying I have the answer to that, I just think that's the question and we're not even asking that question. The, the, the old thinking I think in the war on poverty is um, kick it upstairs, the federal government, and then you can be more efficient in, in, in how to, how to do, deploy resources and, 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 and fix problems. And what you end up doing is you, you reduce these ties that bind people together, which is people together, fighting poverty eye to eye, soul to soul, person to person. And it's, and it's, it's connecting people together in the communities who are helping each other. Um, that is really what matters. Paul has a deep understanding and he's got a deep respect for the font of wisdom that abides in the experience of low-income grassroots leaders, the important role that they can play in the national, on the national stage to reduce poverty. We've been fighting a war on poverty for over 50 years now. And I don't think you can include anything other than this war has been a stalemate. We have 46 million people living in poverty today. I've learned from people just traveling the country that the ideas are out there. We have to reintegrate the poor. That means people need a mentor. They need a job, a boss, a teacher, someone they trust, someone with credibility to help them get from where they are to where they need to be. And what we're doing here today is starting that conversation. And I will tell you that as a kid growing up in a single parent household, I have learned firsthand that conservative principles absolutely, positively, unequivocally is the best path forward to eliminate poverty. Our safety net in America today does not cure poverty. There should be equity between people receiving government assistance and those that are striving to live an independent life. What has to happen is a sliding scale so that as you begin to work and move up and get training, you don't lose all your benefits. Part of the foundation of success in the country, yeah. without any questions, is making sure the kids have access to a quality education. Absolutely. 
The only way to solve this problem is to provide school choice, and I think school choice is done through vouchers that are mediated through the states. We put reading coaches in every elementary school. We put technology in every school and said we are no longer going to educate children based on where they're born and raised. We're going to educate every child because they deserve a good education, and that's our future workforce. Criminal justice reform, which we've enacted, we give judges more discretion now based on what a person did. We can make people better, and when we do that, we do what Ben was talking about, which is to rebuild families. This is a new day for the Republican Party and for the conservative movement. It gives evidence to people who are watching that conservatives have ideas. You've got to return to people the power. Break up the poverty-fighting monopoly and get the power back to the communities so that we can change people's lives for the better. What our grassroots groups do through the various forums and through the comeback series, to me, it is a body of evidence to the American public that the grassroots approach to reducing poverty is the only legitimate way that we can reduce poverty in America. And the comeback series is a way of not only recognizing it, but validating this approach and bringing it into the living rooms of uh, the average American so they can witness firsthand the power of redemption.